thank you everyone um, for coming out here tonight. We are um, we're running a bit on adrenaline, but I think that's good because that adrenaline has come from uh, our conversations in the last few months. Um, we want to start just by thanking Dina and Liesl for um, making the space available for us, all of you who have uh, come out, to, to Alan Walker who's been with us through this whole week and indeed through the whole pandemic as we struggle to get together and finally be able to, to offer these um, talks. Um, Steve Dixon, um, uh, Manolo Callahan, many more people that we need to thank. And we'll try to do uh, justice to all of their generosity. Um, these lectures are dedicated to um, dear sister, Dr. Fumi Okiji, she was at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and we thought that we might start a little bit by um, doing something similar to what Gina has just done. Um, give you a little sense of where, where we, what we've been doing and, and how we've arrived here this evening all week. Um, before we start that, I, again, as we have done on other nights, we want to emphasize that we should feel like we can interrupt us. I, I, I can't see you. <laughs> 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 you should, you should, <laughs> you're here? Uh, interrupt us, raise questions, or, or make comments um, uh, anytime. So uh, I'm going to say a few words about where we've been these last few days and what we're trying to do, and I'll, 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 I'll pass it across to, to Fred Fred's to transition. <coughs> uh, we've had this sort of central contradiction in all of this, which um, I, I'm sure the organizers understand is, you know, is something that we feel that we share a lot of the that we're trying to stand out to say. Um, and that's the basic contradiction of this form um, in which we are uh, on the stage uh, under lights and in that uncomfortable position in which we both have the urge to name um, and in some instances feel like we're being urged to, to name. And yet, at the same time, a lot of what we've been trying to do in these last few months is to is to think about a form of collective study and gathering um, that that doesn't reinforce the relationship between the lecture and another part of its own re word re elect of the trilogy um, and all bound up with that for us are questions of leadership, which we have tried to take up from Cedric Robinson, from Erica Evans, and et cetera. And at the same time, it's very important to say that the other problem is not just being an elect in these situations, but mistaking our concern for personal concern. Uh, we don't care personally stage really is not the issue, you know. I mean, um, somehow we are trying to think about this with you um, in which, in a way in which it doesn't devolve into uh, Fred and Stephanie going on and being, you know, um, up here preaching, right? It's not about that. And so we've tried to figure out different ways to think about the underlying structures that produce and do um, these kinds of uh, distances, um, these kinds of you know, elections. Um, and there are several ways that we try to, to, to address it. One is around, has been around this question of betrayal. Um, again, seeing if we could think about betrayal not as a personal or a moral failing or problem incident, but rather as something that's stuck in our, in our modes of, of producing and reproducing our work. We've also tried to think of it 
with regard to the obviousness. And the reason that we've been using that is that, as some of you heard from previous nights, we, we remember always very well this phrase from Ivan Illich and Paolo Freire's, we're pilgrims of the obvious. And so we can try to think about the obvious. On the one hand, yes, what we're saying is, we got nothing to say to you, you don't know. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, obvious also introduces from its roots, as we said before, this idea that somehow the obvious is the thing that's always blocking you. you know, it's something in the way, or as Barack might say, something in the way of things, as we've said or talked about last night. So there's this kind of block, you know, and the block in turn has a relationship to the way. So what we're trying to suggest by that is that obviousness is different from easiness. Um, that um, something can be obvious, but we don't still find ourselves struggling um, you know, to, um, to, to encounter it as other than uh, an obstacle that appears once again. It's been in the way once again. So we, we've been trying to do this through different thinkers and different locations. Um, we started in the, the Bay Area and when we gave the first talk in Berkeley under the kind of star of Sylvia Winter and of our own personal histories in the Bay. Um, we've tried to think of it through, um, through the, 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 the fascinating political landscape of Guyana. And last night we tried to think of it a little bit in, with regard to Newark and mm. the, the figure of Emilio Baraka, who, mm. as the poet, is a nameless uh, and who sees, but also as somebody you know, who's thinking about the problem of it all the time. And also through an extraordinary book called Lessons in the Van by the Van, a group of working class women who create and narrate a freedom school collectively written about their experiences, the experiences of their children, and it includes analysis, imperialism, analysis of what they call, because this is the subtitle of the book, class struggle in the black community. Um, always the ways in which, yet on the one hand, we're trying to honor this work and this writing, and on the other hand, we're also trying to use it to think about it. What tonight, finally, I guess we're going to identify as the the problem or the question, um, but which is trailed all the time by what we've brought up so far, which is you know, um, the ways in which um, leadership uh, involves a kind of separation. Uh, um, even you could say uh, uh, a kind of loneliness and, and how we might um, think about a, a form of uh, interanimating with each other that didn't rely on this idea of the leadership that sees and that names uh, and, and by so doing creates these relationships. Um, so the last thing I'll say and I'll turn it over to Fred is that central to all this has been exactly what Dina said at How do we get around um, what we've been calling um, the state monopoly of gathering? We, we live in a society in which, yes, we do gather, but we gather under the auspices of the state, the state capital you know, configuration. We don't gather as we wish, and because we gather according to how they want us to gather, um, we're lonely because their gathering numbs us to our actual entanglement, our actual into animation and, um, and so part of what we try to do when we're in imperfect spaces like the one Dean is mentioning here, it's partly inside the, the NGO industrial complex or whatever, or just like when we're in the university, we're in imperfect spaces, is to think about ways in which we um, can, can, can develop self-directed gathering, um, you know, that, um, the, 
it can allow us to feel our antagonists and make us less, less lonely. Um, and somehow and in through that, we also have to raise the question of what we do together and why we do it together and, and, and who we can be. Um, so, so all of what we've been doing those last three nights is, is trying to build up towards these, these questions about um, you know, how, we can, how we can be together, how we can work together. Um, and we're not, all that's happened in the last few nights is the questions have sort of changed. We haven't really got to the answer. But I think we're at least at a point where we can, we can take one more step so I think some new shit can come to life. <laughs> As some of you might have noticed, um, stepping up there is a, un, un, uncanny uh, resemblance to uh, to Jeffrey Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs>
one of the groups that we hang out with and that we love, uh, and Fumi Okiji is part of this group, is we call it the, the Mardi Gras Listen Collective. We, we, we went to this conference called the Cultural Studies Association Conference in, in Pittsburgh, and we found ourselves hanging out at this bar in Pittsburgh called the Mardi Gras. So, so that's, where we, that's the, where the collective got its name. The next time we were able to go together to the Cultural Studies Association, was in New Orleans, which again seemed like a sign. Mm -hmm. So, so we did. And one day, coming in, in a, I was coming home from someplace. I was in LaGuardia, and and this, <laughs> I met this this young, really totally interesting chef, and sort of I would say, what we call it, radical food worker. I guess we would call it named Tundi Way, and. Uh, we ended up striking up a conversation and, and I told him that, that I was coming to New Orleans with my friends and he suggested that we all get together and have lunch. And so we did and we had lunch at a place called Heard That Kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess it was you know, a great name, good pun, the, the family who, who ran it was called Heard. And, and it was an extraordinary meal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but heard that kitchen is on a street in New Orleans called Felicity Street. Mm -hmm. And we were, the conference was at Tulane. If, if you know New Orleans, Tulane is in this part of the city called the Garden District. And it looks like a garden, these big, big old houses. Um, you know, it seems to be, you know, really affluent. And so, you know, we couldn't help but notice the contrast between where the conference was and where we had been hanging out, you know, in order to do our talk or whatever. And, and Felicity Street, the, the street is itself a few blocks away from the Magnolia Street projects, which were infamously, you know, um, the, the, the scene of, a, of another horrible displacement in the wake of Katrina. Projects and, and built up a life in those projects um, were uh, not allowed to return to those projects because of the sense, uh, the false sense that their lives in those projects were sufficiently substandard that that supposed substandardness would be you know, would be the justification for, for their displacement, as if it had been for their own good. Um, we, we've seen this, um, this phenomenon is not, not old. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great scholar named Mindy Full of Love, which is another amazing name, <laughs> who wrote a book called Root Shock which she talks about this specifically, that what happens when the kinds of working class communities that we ordinarily conceive of as blighted, as zones of, of degradation, of, of predatory underclass misbehavior, what happens when people are displaced from those zones? And it, and it often is the case that, that their chances, their life expectancies go down, that they they have been, because what, what again has happened is that the entirety of the, the new modalities of sociality, of, of, and not just sociality, but of a kind of poetic sociality, as, as our old friend R.A. Judy would say, or a, uh, an aesthetic sociality, as our uh, other old friend Laura Harris would say, those, those modalities of sociality are being taken away, literally. This, this combination of displacement and dispossession, right? That is already, you know, a, a new, new regime of displacement and dispossession projected onto the displaced and the dispossessed. Because of course it turns out that the dispossessed still manage under absolute duress to create extraordinary modes of wealth, which not only constitute 
targets for predatory racial capital, but that also constitute the, the basis and the foundation and the resources um, for an alternative. Now, this is the question, or this is one of the questions. It's not, what if it turns out that it is not simply that these modes of life provide resources for people like us to theorize an alternative and also to understand the need for an alternative, right? That, that the experience of their dispossession precisely requires a critique of that dispossession. And at the same time, the, the resources of hope and of wealth and of richness and of insurgency that they make constitutes something like a resource for the alternative. But the question, okay, so all that's preface to the story, or to the, here's the, the last bit of the story. So we, and Felicity Street is one of those streets with a kind of, uh, you know, like a sort of median in the middle, you know, in the median, but it was, <laughs> like remember today we were driving along uh, Powell, yeah. you know, which has a median in Oakland and, and you know, it's, you know, every, you know, it's so pretty out here that, that it fools you into thinking that it's not as ugly as it is, you know. And, but we were in, 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 and we were driving down Powell, but the median was, there's some guy out there, right? Yeah, Remember he was, he was he planting, was planting stuff, yeah. and, you know. There was, the median in, 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 in New Orleans and Felicity Street, it was kind of dusty and dry. The, there, there were still trees, the, the roots had kind of come up out of the ground in a certain kind of way. It was. It was, it was in disrepair. There was one. A oh yeah. Mm. Why why do they why do they call them that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Mm. See, thank you. I, I asked you for help and you helping me and, and, and it makes so much so much sense. Okay, people used to trade there, right? No. I, my grandmother didn't go shopping. She went to trade. Okay. okay, so. Anyway, we were, <laughs> we were driving along and, 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 and there were these very, very small box-like houses. Um, and there was this group of folks maybe three or four black folks, maybe middle-aged. They were sitting out, we really have a porch. The, the front steps went right up into the house. But somebody, some of them were sitting around a card table. I don't know if they were playing cards. They were just sitting there, you know. And there was a kind of, we imagined several different possible ethnographic attitudes that could be projected onto these folks. That, that, that in sitting there, there was, they were exhibiting, you know, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, you know. Um, they were exhibiting some form of substandard behavior in the sense that they weren't working, right? Um, they, the, the, the bareness of the card table, the bareness of the yard seemed to indicate poverty, you know. Um, a kind of destitution that could only ever be the object of improvement. And we had just had all this amazing food and it was fun and we were laughing and we were there with the other people who lived there. We were talking to people who as they came up on the street and this horrible question kind of came to us simultaneously as we were heading back to the garden district. The question is, is it obscene to think that life on Felicity Street is better than life in the Garden District? Mm -hmm. And that's really the root of, this, of these talks and, and this new, I don't know if it's even a project that we're working on or that it coalesced in such a way until you know Ellen kind of gave us the, the chance for for us to think about it that way. Um, but, but that's kind of been the guiding question of our thinking 
for, I don't know, it's been almost five, five years mm -hmm. now. Um, it's connected to some of the stuff that came up, especially last night when we were in Oakland, home of Cedric Robinson and thinking with and, and under his guidance, mm -hmm. you know, where he talks, as you said last night, Steve, about the fact that, you know, the preservation of the ontological totality, the preservation of, of, of the sort of structures and, and, and resources of insurgent resistance, you know, um, in the black radical tradition would manifest themselves as a practice of, you said, metaphysics, as a, as a, as a, as a, as the development of, of a, of a whole other understanding of mind. Well, where does that happen? And what if that whole understand, whole other understand, understanding of mind is bound up with what it is to be involved in that life? And this is, so one dilemma that emerges is for those of us who, you know, we, we might offer a critique of improvement when the brutal forces of improvement are projected onto us and our modalities of, of everyday existence. How do we stave off the impulse to project the necessity for improvement on to the very folks who we think we are working for. Mm -hmm. These are the mm -hmm. questions, some of the questions that emerged. And, um, and so we began to try to read and think a little bit more about, about New Orleans. And, and, and there are two folks whose work have been sort of guiding us, especially in the last few, few months. Um, a great, great, great poet named Fahima Ife and another great, great poet and political organizer and theater practitioner and documentarian uh, named Tom Dent. Um, so we we're gonna try to think with y'all a little bit this, this evening about those folks. So one of the, one of the ways that we've been trying to approach this, this constellation of questions is by an examination on, well, two ways. And the, an examination on the one hand about, around mm, concepts like um, development, improvement, um, and uh, um, on the other hand, thinking about these mm, issues of access. Um, and by thinking about them <clears throat> in, in our common circumstances, we also have a way to think about um, think about Felicity Street, um, because it seems to us that there's a certain kind of access that remains open on Felicity Street. The response to which is almost always brutality. And this is written large in New Orleans and is more commonly understood in, when you hear people talk about New Orleans as a city of extraction. Everybody talks about extraction now, but for a long time in New Orleans, people talked about how the music and the food are extracted from New Orleans. And it meant it in, in the sense that we now more commonly talk about extraction in industries, etc. cetera. Um, and yet somehow, <clears throat> We have a sense that there's there's a kind of necessary uh, access that must be maintained um, if this if this wealth if this if this insurgent resource um, if this militant love is to be preserved. In other words. In other words, it, it can't be guarded by being guarded. It can't be guarded by being turned into property. It can't be, um, it can't be held um, except in this kind of um, dangerous and violent uh, condition 
of remaining open to the possibility of a greater aesthetic sociology, uh, sociology, a, a greater poetic sociology. Um, and this, of course, is something that we can understand in our own circumstances because <clears throat> we, we live in this pull between access and development. We have all of these ways in which we're supposed to be constantly improving ourselves, constantly developing ourselves. If you, if you, if you have a practice, what are you supposed to do with your practice? Well, you know, we hope we could just practice our practice, but no, we should be developing our practice, we should be improving our practice. You know, and, and, and we do this against the backdrop that at the same time, the only way to do this is to open yourself up to different kinds of access, which are hostile accesses. I mean, we have a sense of, of, of always having to reveal more and more of ourselves, of making more and more of ourselves available. Sometimes at the conscious level in which we are trying to maintain some sort of sense of uh, self, but often at the, at the supra-personal or the sub-personal uh, level. And the more that we feel accessed above or below our control, the more we're liable to make what Fred and I often refer to as a subject reaction. Try to put ourselves back together. And every time we put ourselves back together, we become that very being, that individual, who is most vulnerable to the call of development, the call of improvement. And that's the way in which these things act together. And yet, you know, there, there is something about that access which is vital to our ability to be together and to work together. And yet every time we open it up, it's exploited. Um, and we see this in the kind of condensed way on Felicity Street. Um, but on Felicity Street, it's been, it's, it's been somehow severed from from this compulsion to improve, this compulsion to develop, um, this impulse, compulsion to innovate. Um, and that on the one hand makes the reaction, the, the violent expropriating re reaction all the more vicious and you know, um, all the more easy to justify from the perspective of those who are we're doing it, but from our perspective, it raises a question about um, how how we might find ways to open ourselves, despite this imminent threats, in a way that um, would not lead us to try to put ourselves back together again and go back onto that treadmill of improvement and development, which is never satisfactory enough, and we're, never sat and we're never satisfied with it, nor is capital ever satisfied with it, or workplace, or anywhere else. So these are some of the questions that we <clears throat> started with, but then, of course, we start to think about ourselves in relationship um, to this, and I'm going to say ourselves, now I am talking about me and Fred and our experience there, and, and you know, and the question of you know how how would we how would we go you know home to New Orleans um, how could we miss New Orleans Tom Dent as a figure is a figure who returns to New Orleans after going to New York because New Orleans for him is suffocating his ability to do his work he wants to go and he goes to New York in order to develop his writing in order to improve his his craft he he becomes part of the Umbra Black Writers Group. But then at a certain point, he comes back to New Orleans. So he's been a kind of guide for us to, in thinking about you know, how he has, he has, he has, how he comes back to New Orleans. Um, and yeah, well, let me, let me pause there for a minute. Well, it, it raises, specific kind of analytic problems you know if 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 what you 
See, look, I mean, <clears throat> is our primary function uh, uh, to be engaged in, in, a, in a critique of already existing structures of, of thought and, and of power and of brutality? Um, if so, it would be in the service of an alternative. But the alternative is at hand. How is it that the alternative exists under the duress of those forces which seem so brutal and so all-consuming? Um, how did we come to see those things? That's the double edge of Baraka's poem. There's something in the way of things, something blocking the alternative. And at the same time, there is something in the way of things, which is to say there is the alternative which seems to infuse the way in which we live, even though it appears to be under the abs under, 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 under a kind of duress of, of absolute severity. So the Felicity Street thing, you know, from the critical perspective, it raises this issue. What if it turns out that the, the forces of improvement, which are also the forces of theft and enslavement, what if it turns out that yes, they are engaged in and interested in extraction. And they are also engaged and interested in displacement and, 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 and theft. But what they're really engaged in all the time, what their primary function appears to be is the constant repression of the alternative, of the very idea of it. Um, it's like you take away everything and then you come and take away everything that, 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 that was built in the wake of everything having been taken away. What were they taking away? And, and, and how do we... So, so, so it feels to us like New Orleans is an extraordinarily important place to think about this. Why? Because, you know, the, 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 the mapping and the cataloging of mutual aid that Dina has done here in the Bay Area reminds us of the intensity of the historical force of mutual aid in, 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 in New Orleans, which sometimes, um, which, which actually has a, another name and maybe even a more precise name, um, the idea of social aid and pleasure. Social aid and pleasure clubs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the social aid and pleasure clubs which, which produce, you know, famously, these very specific modalities of performance that we see in, in, in the carnival. And New Orleans is a town with a carnival tradition because New Orleans is a Caribbean city. And, and so part of what's at stake is one way to think about it is a, a very specific, sometimes people might think problematic claim upon a kind of indigeneity. How do you begin to think through the whole problem or the, the chance of what one might call the indigeneity of the displaced? Right? What if it turns out that what's at stake is not just resistance to the displacement of the indigenous, but what if what emerges is a recognition that indigeneity and a kind of radical displacement go together? So that what's at stake is making the distinction between their displacement and ours, which is also a distinction between their complicity and, and ours. And, and, and this is, and, and New Orleans occasions this thinking and, and, and occasions it really, really beautifully in the work of, of Fahima Ife. And I just wanted to read a couple passages of hers. Um, one from an interview in uh, Black Agenda Report, um, the, the online journal that for many years was so um, sort of beautifully and carefully edited by, uh, oh man. Glenn Ford. The late, great Glenn mm -hmm. Ford. Mm -hmm. um, she says, and in all that active and communal marvel, 
we move beyond the impulse to refer to ourselves as activists and community organizers or even artists and instead try to figure out what it is we want to do together. And then from her beautiful book, Maroon Choreography, which is a book that I think Liesl really is deeply in, she teaches at Louisiana State University, and I think, but lives in New Orleans, and my sense of it is that this book is deeply, deeply bound up with what it is to, to be moving along that path between those two cities, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and to know that when you're moving in, the, in that space, you're moving in a space which is dominated by a history of brutality on the one hand and a history of insurgent revolt on the other. And you're moving through that history constantly in, in that road, on that road. Um, and she writes, at the end of this, all I have is a stronger practice, a clearer sense of where I exist in relation to everything and nothing. I study, I move, I open, I have nothing else, no resolution, no answers, ruin all around us, there is no rest, but friendship amongst the pneumatic ones, the airy ones, the forest ones. For those of us who never find the privilege of rest are free to fall into porous aftermath, become orgiastic wine, dance out of nothing, become nothing, become all. And what emerges in that becoming nothing and becoming all is again, bound up very much with what Baraka is talking about and even more so what the damned are talking about in Newark. And it feels like it's very much bound up with what Martin Carter is interested in and invested in in, 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 in Guyana, in the notion of what it is for all to be involved, um, enfolded, right? So it's, it's a, there's a way in which you begin to think through what it would mean to resolve a paradox. And then eventually, with maybe a certain amount of wisdom, not, res not resignation, but, but a, deeper, uh, a deeper fire, you become interested in what it means to live the contradiction. Cedric Robinson used to talk about it all the time, right? right? You know, we often find ourselves invested in the idea that it is our duty to resolve a contradiction. It's a, it's a kind of hubris that comes from a certain kind of reading of Marx. I don't know if Marx was ever so much interested in the resolution of contradiction, but, 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 but Marxists often are. Um, but, but, but what Robinson is talking about is He's always saying, well, now is the time to just, the contradictions are, 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 are incredible. They're, 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 they, they seem to be almost unbearable. Um, he says, and so now is the time to heighten them. <laughs> but then every once in a while, you know, he would say, but now is the time to deepen them. Mm -hmm. So how do we both deepen and heighten the contradictions rather than try to resolve the contradiction. And, and, it, and again, I, it, it, it appears to us that, that one of the contradictions that emerges when one becomes conscious, let's say, of class struggle in black communities. And it's a contradiction that also becomes apparent when one becomes con conscious of class struggle in black studies, right? Okay. Say, you know, so, well, you know, well uh, I, I hate the university, but, but you know, so I'm going to be an a, a scholar activist, you know, and hedge my bet, you know. Um, I, 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 I hate the university, though I'm in it, and I will call, you know, for its abolition. And those positions, we don't, we're not interested in critiquing those positions because they are absolutely legitimate as positions. There's no argument against those positions, the content of those positions. But what if the argument is against the very idea of positionality, right? That, that, that this becomes, that when we deepen the contradiction and heighten the contradiction, what we're doing is refusing, right, the way in which the, the way in which a certain, in, 
the, the way in which the idea of resolution of the contradiction is meant to, 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 to produce some new position to occupy, some new ground to stand on, some new alternative concept, rather than this rolling with and involvement in the deepening and heightening of the contradiction that will allow us to see the something in the way of things that persists against the grain of the blockage, right, in the way of things. This is, it, I don't, I'm blathering now, but, but, so I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> so, so in, 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 in light of all that, um, we, <laughs> we, we seek ways to, to, to um, let's say, emulate what Clyde Woods calls blues universities. And by that he means gatherings in social spaces that are um, at least partly uh, um, uh, in violation of how the state wants us to gather. Uh, or capital wants us to gather. Um, but there are also places where um, they're the opposite, you know, in many ways of, of what we understand of, as a, a learning space. Um, you know, learning spaces are places where you learn to be yourself more, you know. There, there are spaces where you learn to develop your, your interests, your tastes, your intellect, whatever the case may be. In other words, there are spaces of individuation. There are spaces in which you're, we're encouraged um, to stand out. If you have any graduate students in the audience tonight, you know the, 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 the pinnacle of this is that moment when your supervisor says, what's your unique contribution you know, to the field, right? Um, and, and that's the moment when you feel absolutely the loneliest, right? <laughs> Uh, and that's, there's no contradiction there, you know, in that case, you know, except you, you've got to live that contradiction. Why? Because you love to study. But all of the learning spaces of study run opposite of what happens with the Blues University or what happened with Tom Dent's, you know, writer's workshop, for instance, that he sets up in New Orleans. They run counter to, to what Tom Dent calls, you know, all power to the parade, to the carnival, etc. Why? Because they they are constantly encouraging your individuation. They're constantly encouraging your your separation from from those around you. But when you go to study in a blues university, you're studying to be incomplete. You're studying not to rise to the to the level of the individual in that sense. It's a often deadly way to study, you know. Um, I don't mean, we don't mean to romanticize it, and yet it's a necessary way to study. Black study is a study that puts you at odds with the powers of the world, you know. Black studies isn't, but black study is, right? And nonetheless, there's a relationship between black studies and black study, as we've been saying for years, which is important, you know, for, for our ability to think these things. So these blues universities, which are, you know, um, take the form of, of pleasure clubs and mutual aid clubs, etc., but also of, 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 of bars, of, of kitchen tables, of, of porches, um, studies going on all around us, and blues university study in particular, as Clyde Wood says, is that very place where an alternative is being practiced all the time, and that alternative central to it is the attack, uh, is the counterattack, pardon me, the, 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 or the counter counterinsurgency, as Manolo Callahan might put it. The, it's, it's, it's the counterattack on individuation. It's the counterattack on the notion that you should be improving, on the notion that, that, that the city should be developing, uh, on, on the very idea uh, that what completion means is for you to be able to hold yourself forth as an individual, as a subject, um, as someone who is capable of self-determination, self-possession, self-ownership, 
the whole horrid history of colonialism, the whole horrid history of the plot, as Sylvia Winter uh, would call it, in which you emplot yourself as somebody who is capable of measuring yourself in time and space right now so that you can create around yourself that plot which becomes your property, that property which becomes your right to defend it against others, meaning to attack them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This entire history of the self-made man um, that we've spoken about before, the lie of the entrepreneur, the lie of the self-made man, the lie of the businessman, the captain of industry, those figures on, on the pedestals that have yet to be torn down, Right? Sometimes they're both, you know, like roads. But often, you know, they're still standing. These businessmen on these on these plinths, right? And and with them the myth that is possible to be self made, that is possible to stride out on your own. But of course, if you went behind one of the statues of these businessmen, what you would see, if you could really see it, were a whole set of tubes in his back into which run the cries and screams of the women and children who helped him to get ready that day, into which run the blood of Africa, into which run the, 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 what's left of the indigenous uh, lives of, 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 of Latin America, etc., etc. Right? That, in order to become an individual, you have to kill and keep killing. Uh, you have to exploit and keep exploiting. And this is precisely what we're called to do in learning spaces. Sometimes we, we don't, you know, we're, we don't like really being associated that much with a critique of the university because, you know, critiques, as Fred said, they tend to get drawn into reform rather than into the alternative or into the insurgency. And plus, you know, we, you know, we don't, we work in the university, but we don't give a shit about it. You know? <laughs> Just like somebody who works in a car plant doesn't give a shit about like, geez, what's the future of Ford? I wish I knew. <clears throat> oh, man, it's really bothering me. Um, so, <clears throat> so the blues universities, you know, a way of getting together to study that doesn't lead to your improvement, your individuation, doesn't lead to acolytes, doesn't lead to your success. Uh, it, it's a place where you go. It can be a painful place where people help you to, to, to get away from this dangerous notion um, that you are self-determined and self-made. It's not exactly that we're trying to say everybody's got to go home. <laughs> everybody's got to go back to Felicity Street. It's, it's, that's not... No what we're trying to say. It's hard to say, say it. I mean, the question of, the would-be boss who struggles for his individuation and learns that it is impossible, right? Mm. You know, who becomes a Hegelian without ever having read Hegel? <laughs> he is his counterpart. is is the would be poet of the people, like Tom Dent, who had to leave New Orleans. Uh, we 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 talk about it a lot in relation to. Uh, our attorney, uh, the great Oscar Zeta Costa, <laughs> you know, um, I had to leave friends and family in order to remain whole, in order to remain one. Um, that that tragic contradiction befalls Tom then. Mm -hmm. That's why he goes to New York. But what he was looking for in New York wasn't possible in New York. And the, and the impossibility of it shows up at this double level. Not, not so much that it was impossible to become a poet, but that it was impossible that becoming a poet would give him what it is that he thought he wanted, which is to say what it is that he thought he was missing, 
which is to say what it is that he knew was being withheld from him. Not individuation, but the fantasy of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens with Dent is so deeply bound up with what it is that Martin Carter begins to talk about in Guyana in 1953 in a book called Poems of Resistance. Um, or, and then begins to extend, you know, later on in his work in the 70s in, in ways that are beautifully contemporaneous with Tom Dent, right? Um, this is a famous early post-colonial, if you will, anti-colonial poem by, by Carter, and we wanted to read it because it connects up to these passages from Dent that we want to read. Carter says, this is a poem called You Are Involved. This I have learned, today a speck, tomorrow a hero, hero or monster, you are consumed. Like a jig shakes the loom, like a web is spun, the pattern, all are involved, all are consumed. That all, that term, which Ife shares with Carter, and with Dent, and it comes back in this very rich way in a couple of texts from Dent, one called Report from New Orleans, another an interview with the great poet Kalamu Yas Salam that was in African American Review in the 80s. So I'll read these two passages. The first is a passage about, well, I'll just read it. The second line is everybody's thing together and everybody's thing for themselves. And for the first time in a long time, he really didn't want to leave New Orleans because as the trumpet of Wallace Davenport darts out, echoing off sun rays, he knows there won't be anything like this in LA or Chicago or Detroit. There is something about this moment that can't be defined by money or jobs or progress or new buildings. But he noticed that the Olympia had stopped playing the excitement had cooled down and the good dream got lost. So when the parade was over, he would have to get back to his plans to leave. So much for the weird town, this 1975th year of the Anglo calendar wavering in the wind of history. And then here's a passage from the interview. But just keep in mind, it, you have to leave when the parade is over. So the whole point is for the parade never to be over. This constancy of approach, of being in the way, of being in the way of one another, mm -hmm. of being in the way of one another so much so that one and another seem to disappear in that way. That being in the way of one another, Walter Rodney called it grounding. Mm -hmm. um, there's this interplay of the notion of grounding and approaching and gathering, and that's what Dent is saying, right? And it's always under duress, because that's what the motherfuckers want to take away, right? Um, not, they'll take the food, they'll take the land, they'll take the money, mm -hmm. but what they really want to take away is the gathering. Mm -hmm. He writes, so in coming back here and becoming involved with y'all, right? This is after he returned to New Orleans, I felt that no matter what happened to me in my career as a writer, at the very least, we could begin to provide a nurturing community. That took the form of a workshop and some other activities. It expanded into social activities, relationships, everything, because you can't write in social and cultural isolation. Writing goes with reading, the exchange of ideas, and the excitement that comes from being part of something that is bigger than you. That was one of the personal motivations. If I was going to be back here, I wanted to see something develop so that when interested younger people came along, they wouldn't face the same isolation and alienation I felt that drove me away. It's, what's at stake is, okay, I got to twist my brain up as hard as I can to try to see if it's possible not to resolve a contradiction but to articulate it. Um, and then hopefully it'll disappear. 
not the contradiction, but the articulation of it. Because it's not about staying or leaving. He left, but he never left, right? It was always in him. He couldn't leave what was in him, right? It's like the way we sometimes use that term holding space. Yeah, you hold the space that holds you, right? You can't get rid of it, you can't leave it, right? So you hold it, you know? Um, you're supposed to, you're supposed to try, right? What does it mean to hold the space that holds you? What does it mean to not be able to leave New Orleans? That's really what it was. Even in his leaving, he couldn't leave. Right? He came to understand the deep, true meaning of that old song, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? He couldn't, couldn't leave. Right? He had never left. His travel, his displacement was always somehow there, whether he was already there or whether he had left there. Right? This, he, and, and what's deep is this, this, this almost horrific cosmic sense of homelessness of what it is not to have a spatio-temporal coordinate, right? Um, this, this seemingly terrible and unlivable restlessness, right? That, that Fahim Ife talks about. It's as if what happens is that he comes to claim it and to be involved in it. Because to be involved in that restlessness, to be involved in that homelessness with all of y'all, right, is to practice the alternative to the vicious monsters who stake their claim and stand their ground. Grounding is the refusal of that claim the refusal of that standing. Okay. And, and this is what Dent comes to understand, we think. And, and what you realize is it's not about staying here or leaving. It's about who are you with? Who are you involved with? Do you have some friends? That seems like a good place maybe to see if we can't all be involved. <laughs> so if, if you don't mind, maybe we could see if anybody would like to make a comment or ask a question or anything like that so that we, we, we can perform a little bit of, uh, of all involvement. You gotta go in 15 minutes. <laughs> so, um, um, but we'll, we'll, do, we'll do the best we can. Um, thank you for the talk today. Um, I guess my question is, should I stand up? Is that, would that be helpful? Uh, my question is about like voicing and um, leadership. Because uh, I met you on the first night and I almost couldn't look you in the face, which is probably a me thing more than it is a you thing, or like an us thing, you know, I was really nervous. Um, and you did something to my voice where I feel like I couldn't really articulate what it was I was trying to say to you. Um, and it reminded me of this, the experience I have reading your work, where, um, or like the moment where I first started to kind of get a sense of how to read you, um, I was trying to make my friend Erica laugh. She was cooking. So I started reading Black Op, trying to impersonate you. Um, 
and kind of being like, oh, I'm like, I'm Fred Moten, and um, <laughs> just, <laughs> and um, when I started to like, when I got the cadence of your voice um, and tried the impersonation, it started to make more sense to me. <laughs> and um, I was watching Eddie Murphy's Raw last night, and um, the first 20 minutes of his set are a series of uh, impersonations, the first of Cosby um, <laughs> and the second of uh, Pryor. And uh, I realized Tell that- Tell Bill they have a coke and a smile and shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I realized what I was trying to do and what Eddie was trying to do was sort of um, parse out like a lineage for themselves, uh, for himself, and I think that's what I was trying to do too. And um, you kind of mentioned carnival and uh, the parade and pleasure, and I was just wondering like, um, if you had any thoughts about like laughter, his relationship to leadership and how it relates to like um, kind of pushing up against that self-importance that you were talking about during your first lecture when you were at Berkeley. Well, um, okay, I got it. <laughs> there's, there's so much in, in, in what you say. Um, now, I'm going to say something, and you have to help me by believing that I really do mean it and that it's not just one of the greatest things in my life was driving around in California and in, in Riverside. I, I got to the point where my, I can't read that much because my eyes are so bad. You see, I got to take my glasses off to read. That's really bad, right? <laughs> um, and I just hold the shit up like so I got to the point where I was reading, listening to books on tape a lot, you know, driving. And if you, one of the great works of art of the late 20th century is Ruby Dee's reading of Their Eyes Were Watching God. Like you, if you, if you ever get a chance to listen to it, it's beautiful, it's amazing. <laughs> and I really heard all this stuff. Like you say, it, books are supposed to be read out loud. Not, necessarily by the people who wrote them. Maybe almost necessarily not that, you know. And I don't know if something like, okay, I'm, I'm rambling. Let me try to calm myself down. Um, there's a line in, in their eyes of watching God has become my favorite line. And I think about it often with regard to Steve, who Stefano is Steve, as you, as you know. <laughs> so, because we're old like that, but but uh, he calls him Stefano's what your dad calls you. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, <laughs> my mom called me Frederick. You know, <laughs> my mom and his dad met at Bill Corbett's house for dinner the night before we graduated from college. <laughs> but they meet all the time. They hang out with us all the time. They're with us all the time. They, they were colleagues, if you will, <laughs> you know. And, um, and it's like Phoebe and Janie on the porch, you know, when Janie says, my, my, my tongue is in my friend's mouth. I mean, we, we so I don't, it's no my, we, we just been working together and thinking together like that but also with all the other people that we know and all our friends, all our, our teachers. We were thinking today about our friend, Rich Lopez. <laughs> the first place we ever published anything was in his zine called Riding the Blinds, which is, he, you know, and, and what, what I'm trying to, I don't know that there's, the poet, is been given is gives, given the power to see and name, but what's at stake is the practice of seeing and naming, which does not gather 
which does not ossify, which cannot be held or contained within any, any individual figure called a poet or any individual work called a poem. The practice of seeing and naming exceeds any container that it is supposedly held within. And there's no such, what if there's no such thing as voice? But what if there is voicing? This constant voicing of the chord, right? Like in some kind of crazy, like Ellingtonian, phantasmagoric thing, you know, where, you know, you have Harry Carney playing the low note, you know, and, and, and high note, and, and Cat Anderson playing the, the low note, you know, like the, the, the it's, uh, it's, all this new harmonics can emerge as a function of the, the anarchy of, of, of voicing, right? That's what Richard Pryor, that's, you know, at, in, you know it, there's, in that, ch in Raw, doesn't he say, Eddie Murphy, when he started out trying to do comedy, he would do something called a tribute to Richard Pryor, right? In which all he would do is Richard Pryor's thing. What I'm saying is that, that it's not ventriloquism. It, it's what he was after, what he wanted, it seems to me, was the richness and the, and, the, and the overpopulation of voicing in Richard Pryor, right? Like, as if every voice that had ever been in Peoria, which meant every voice that had ever been in Peoria and had ever been any place where anybody ever came to Peoria from, like Tudlums and Mudbone, you know, all of that was in there, and that's what Eddie Murphy was trying to get, right? All of that voicing, all of that gathering, all of that approaching, right? All of that grounding, that's what's there in there. And that's what, that's what we're always trying to, to get, you know? And, um, and it is bound up with laughter. Like this, okay, and then I'm gonna stop, because he should say something, because he gotta go, you know? But like, <laughs> one time, when Cedric Robinson was getting ready to retire, they did a big tribute for him at UCSB. And the thing he did was, he said, everybody got there the evening before the conference started because he wanted everybody to see a movie. And the movie he wanted everybody to see was Devil in a Blue Dress. Okay. Now he wanted everybody to see Devil in a Blue Dress because he was absolutely committed to the deep political importance of Mouse. He's like, there can be no liberation movement without, you have to have a mouth. Yep. And if y'all know, you can look it up, mouse, if you don't know. It's the character that Don Cheadle plays, who at one point says, this is mouse. If you didn't want to kill Thiezy, why you leave him with me, <laughs> right? So, but there's this other moment that we love, you know, in that film, and it's right at the end, where Denzel's sitting on the porch with his friend Deacon, I think Ezel, mm -hmm. And they're talking, and you know, Denzel's doing the voiceover. He says, and, and I just sat, we drank about a quart of whiskey, and I sat with my friend, and we laughed a long time. Okay. Now, I guess that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have to go, and I'm sorry about that, but that doesn't mean you all have to break up your gathering. Um, the other thing that they say at the very end of that movie, because he's asking, should he be friends with somebody like Mouse? And Deacon says, all you have is your friends. Um, and it is all that you have. So um, indulge yourself with some friendship. Thank you.
something agile. You got something, Leela? Are you leaving? We've still got Fred. It's not the same. A lot's been said. <laughs> Hi. That was a wonderful conversation between you guys. Here I am. So uh, I, have a, I have a question, and that is, uh, isn't one of the key things of the moment, or issues of the moment, uh, the value of individuation, especially in light of how it, how uh, as 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 a value, it exists amongst uh, the group or the society, because uh, in the idea of I mean, it seems that any any kind of gesture, let alone a radical gesture, is a, a kind of individu individuation, but. You know the way it's constructed in our, in this society, in this culture, is what can, you know, obviously it's caused immeasurable problems. Well, I, so we we have a, a friend. Um, we're very lucky to have her work to constantly refer to, um, and we were doing it today, all the all the time without mentioning her. So. It's important to mention her now. I mean, we, we, we usually always do. Her name is Denise Ferreira da Silva. And um, so when, when Stefano was talking about the necessity of being, of openness, what it means to be, what does it mean that somehow, in some deep, deep cosmic unfairness, the ones who have been most violated have the ethical responsibility to remain vulnerable. Right. Because remaining vulnerable, remaining permeable, remaining entangled, to use the word that Denise uses, remaining affectable, okay, is, is a protocol, is, a, is an indispensable protocol for the continuing practice of the alternative. the notion of individuation that we're trying to argue against is a notion of uh, the refusal of what Denise calls affectability, the refusal of permeability, the refusal of, of entanglement. But you, you're right that somehow there still needs to be room for what it is that we would ordinarily want to think of as the, the liberatory gesture, the liberatory movement of the alternative that, that seems to show up in the normal way of looking at, at things as a moment of individual freedom, as a moment of individual assertion against the stultifying, you know, sort of force of, of group think, let's say. But, but, but with Denise in mind, and as our, you know, sort of tutor, you know, we start to think, well, maybe there's a more precise way to, to, to discuss it, you know, so that what we're not, what we're not seeking after is individuation, but the difference, right? And what we want to, what it means to be all involved what it means to be engaged in the practice of the alternative is this constant protection of the force of difference and differentiation. It's not in the interest of sameness. It's in the interest of this sort of constant aeration of, of, of the all. Okay. So what if it turns out that individuation is not meant to militate against sameness, but it's like a protocol for the imposition of it. That's the way so-called individualism seems to work in, in, in this place that we live in, right? It, it, this, it shows up as like the proliferation of false choices, right? 
a proliferation of false choices that are meant to allow you to individuate, but that only ever allow you to be the same and to operate within a framework that has already been established for you. And so, so we begin to think that individuation is the incarceration of difference, not the expression of it. Um, and, and so everything that we're trying to talk about under the rubric of involvement is in the interest of this constant differentiation, right? Which turns out to be given by way of vulnerability rather than by way of the sort of, you know, refusal of, of vulnerability. But, but again, that's a hard lesson. That's a hard, that's, it's, a, it's almost like it's a cruel thing to say, you know? How is it that the people who have been most brutalized have the, why is it that they have the ethical responsibility to remain vulnerable? How is it that the people whose differences have been most violently suppressed, right? How come, it, how is it that they are the ones who have the ethical responsibility to resist individuation? And it's like, if you, if you, you, you begin to ask yourself those questions and it, and it, and it almost feels like cruel to, to say that that's the case. But, but that ethical responsibility is ours, it seems, because it's, because this other shit ain't working, you know? Um, and so uh, that's why it's hard to say. It's hard to say it to somebody, you know, who's been, you know. But it's also hard to say because it's just, it goes against the grain of the way we've been educated. You know? um, but, um, but the point is, is, you know, we're trying to ask some questions about that. Um, so. Hey, Brent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I uh, heard you reference, oh, hey, I'm here. Okay, hey. Hey, uh, I heard you reference Cedric Robinson many times tonight, and uh, I'm pretty obsessed with his work, and, and especially the book Black. And uh, I was wondering if you could share some uh, thoughts or memories or the influence that Cedric Robinson had had on you. Well, my first job was at the University of Iowa, and they have a really great bookstore there um, called Prairie Lights, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And, uh, and I used to go in there all the time, like every day. And it got to the point where they would like half hold stuff for me. They, they knew I was weak, you know? Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm thinking about it. I his friend, it's really, beautiful person, beautiful friend named uh, Hakan Debel. He was from Turkey, Izmir. And I remember one time they had, I know David, I know you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, University of California Press uh, put out uh, a new edition of Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy. And they were three volumes, this beautiful bright red, this beautiful blue, like, and it's green. And I just had to get them, you know? <laughs> and I remember I got them, and uh, Hakan came to my office. He was a grad student, you know, and I was my first job, so I felt way more comfortable hanging out with grad students than, than with my so-called colleagues, which I pretty much still do. But, um, but I put them on the bookshelf, not even in some special place. You know, I just put them in the place on you know, my bookshelves in the office that, that I had to have room for them. And Hakan came in and his eye went to him immediately. And I'll never forget, he just said, oh, they're beautiful. <laughs> you know, so, but um, that's a total digression. But the point is, is but, but, uh, but Prairie Lights, there was a book that caught my eye at Prairie Lights. It was the Z edition, the black one, you know, of black Marxism. And all I knew was is there's a book called Black Marxism. I, I have to get that. I didn't know who Cedric Robinson was. Now, eventually, a few years later, I was teaching for a year at NYU, 
and they had these at this big conference every other year at University of Massachusetts in Amherst called Rethinking Marxism. And he was on a panel. He was on a panel with Ruthie Gilmore. It was organized by Nikhil Singh. And I'll never forget, Nikhil Singh wanted to ask him, ask him this question that was basically a question that was designed to get him to dog Paul Gilroy. And Cedric Robinson he just looked at him and said, no, we don't have to do that. And I was like, man, this, who is this man, <laughs> you know? Later, I had a chance to work with him um, at UCSB. He, he was upstairs. His office was right above mine in, in, the, in the same building. He was in Black Studies. I was in the English department. And I would just go in there. Go. His, old, his door was always open. Um, he was just a, a brilliant, generous, but an amazingly deep, deep, deep thinker. He was a political theorist who brought political theory to an end. The, his, his dissertation does that, The Terms of Order, which was later published. And it's, it's an extraordinary book. Our book, All Incomplete, that phrase comes from The Terms of Order. And he was just always nice, but always sharp, like fearless the way he thought the way he thinks. And um, actually, I got one, one of my prize possessions at the, at the it was American Studies Association in Los Angeles years ago, maybe 15, I don't know, a long time ago now. Um, and I got a picture. I, I wish we had a screen I would put, me, him, and Steve um, in the parking lot of the Western Hotel, <laughs> you know. Um, but he, his partner, Elizabeth Robinson, he, he, he held a space, if you will, for, for, for radical thinking, you know? And, 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 and his, the, in, the, in, the intensity of his thinking was such that he never seemed to be the kind of person that was gonna tell you how come you shouldn't read something. Um, so his, his thinking for us is, is absolutely indispensable. Um, and this imperative to, as he says, preserve the ontological totality, you know, that's, that's our imperative too. And, um, and I believe it implicit in his work is the sense that the necessity that, that the imperative to preserve the ontological totality is carried out by way of the constant practice of the differentiation of that ontological totality. Um, so he was, I feel very, very lucky to just have ever been in a room with him. Thank you.